Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm continuing my series of videos on tornadoes. Um, you know, six tornadoes um, last Friday, September 21st. So, talking about what's going on in Canada with tornadoes. So basically, um, just to remind you, um, if you Google tornadoes in Canada, everything you need to know, there's an excellent article that came out um, August 7th of this year. Um, and I'm discussing some of the maps in this article. Okay, so first of all, 62 and chart, 62 tornadoes per year in Canada. Um, about 12 and a half on average in Ontario, about 4.7 in Quebec. So, um, and you, we just had um, two in Ontario and one of those in Ontario went into Quebec, so it'd be counted twice. And so, and then three others in Quebec. Um, and this is where they occur. This is all confirmed and probable tornadoes um, from 1980 through 2009. Okay, now the, this is according to the Brigida F scale, not the EF scale. Okay, so there's been some change of the scale, so keep that in mind. That happened in 2013 in Canada. And you can see the only one um, of the very most powerful F5 tornadoes and three F4s here, two here, five F4s, F3s, um, and so on. Okay, um, now the, so, so the probabilities were given, uh, this is a tornado prone map published in the National Building Code, you know, so build your buildings, um, you can't build them to withstand an F5, but this is a region where you expect F2 to F5s here and here, F0 to F1s, and very rare as you go further north. So one thing, in a warming climate, just dreams changing, uh, we would expect more tornadoes to come to occur in, in Canada and perhaps less in, in Tornado Alley, as I mentioned previously. A um, couple things on, on uh, tornado safety. Flying debris poses the greatest danger to your safety. You know, one of the things in Ottawa, we have basements. In Kansas, there's very few basements. So, you know, you get down into the basement. Um, when a tornado threatens, take shelter immediately. Lower level of a sturdy building. Um, not in a mobile home, one of the worst places. Uh, those things just get tossed easily. You know, monitor on your, we all have, most of us have smartphones. Monitor the severe weather. Install Radar Scope, which is the app that I use, which is fantastic. There's a f you know, free version, or you can pay 10 bucks a year and see lightning, I believe. But most of the features are there in, in a, in a free or like two or three or, or it's a few bucks um lie flat in a ditch ravine or low-lying area shield your head if you're caught outdoors with no shelter available um and there's other tornado tips and so on okay now let's talk a little bit about the physics of of the of drag so you know moving air over surfaces and things um not too much. What I want to do is point out, there's a couple of different types of drag here. So if you've got high winds this way, there, this, is, uh, this is a piece of plywood on end, for example. So there's very little form drag. You know, the air just goes across, but there's skin friction. The air comes here and there's friction on the surface. So that's 100% and the form drag is very, very small. Here, you know, you've got some cross-sectional surface. So the form drag is higher. Skin friction would be 90%, form drag 10. Here it's reversed, you've got 90% is the drag and 10% is the skin friction. And here 100% is the form drag and there's no skin friction. Um, but, it, but the key point here is the drag force depends on the properties of the fluid on the size, shape and speed of the object going through it. Okay, so there's a, there's a drag equation. F the for drag force is one half, rho is the density of the fluid, velocity squared, V is the speed of the object relative to the fluid, CD is some drag coefficient, um, and A is the cross-sectional area. So the larger the cross-sectional area you have to the, to the fluid flow, the larger the, f the, the drag force is. 
Okay, the faster the velocity, double the velocity, the drag is four times faster. So um, if you're driving a car and you go 120 kilometers versus 100 kilometers, that's a 20% increase in speed. 1.2 is, is the multiplication factor. 1.2 squared is 1.44. So you'd be 44% more drag force on a car going 120 versus going 100. Now there's another factor here is the, the, is the power. Power is the force um, times the, 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 power is the drag force times the velocity. So you get another velocity in there, you get, so that brings a V squared up to V cubed here. Okay, so the power of a wind goes as V cubed to the velocity. This is why, you know, a 240, this is why there's thresholds for building damage. You know, at some velocity, every building is fine. Go up, you know, 10 kilometers an hour, every building is damaged. You, you cross this threshold, this power threshold. You know, if you increase the velocity um, a small amount, then the power will increase a large amount because it goes as the third power. Okay, those are just things that I wanted to show you, uh, talk about in terms of wind damage. It's very highly nonlinear. It goes as the power goes as the cube of the velocity. The force, drag force, goes as the square of the velocity. So you know it's very important in the wind industry, for example. Okay, you have a wind turbine. You know, at eight meters a second wind, you might get a power of 314 watts. Go up to uh, 16. From so from. So uh, go up double the velocity and you get eight times more power, 2509 watts per square meter. So again, we get the V cube dependence here for uh, power that a wind turbine can generate and that jives with the, you know, this power form power here, okay? So, so all I'm doing is I'm here, I'm just Googling, uh, well, just Googling, uh, this is on Wikipedia looking at drag, I just Googled friction and drag and wind speed and damage to buildings, etc. And you can find this and many, many other sites. Okay. Um, so, you know, I just, if you wind damage to buildings versus wind speed, you can have a look. There's all kinds of publications. There's all kind. you know, it depends on building codes. It depends on uh, wall area. It depends on local, localized winds. So the terrain surrounding it depends on the buildings around it, depends on the speed of the, you know, how long, the duration of the wind. So, you know, this storm um, with that wind, given that wind speed, this storm was moving 80 kilometers an hour. So there wasn't time to trash all the buildings. It damaged lots of things, but it didn't bring total destruction to the area. Um, again, so, so the duration of the winds is also very important. Um, if you just Google images and tornado science, then you get this type of thing. And I'll look at some of these diagrams here in particular. So, so this is um, this is a very good image of uh, tornado formation. Let's see if I can expand it in size a bit, so you can see it a bit better. Okay, so a couple things here. Um, you know, here you have water spouts, land spouts, diameter of this type of tornado can exceed its height, multiple vortex. Most of these are powerful tornadoes that cause heavy damage. So you can get multiple vortices. Most devastating tornado in history killed <coughs> 1,300 people in Bangladesh in 1989. So, so this is a type of image. So counterclockwise rotation, low pressure area here. There's a huge updraft here. There's this suction effect, okay? The pressure inside the tornado can be 0 0.4 atmospheres. So 40% of what the pressure is normally at the surface. Um, so it's a huge pressure drop. Um, so this would be, um, you know, a drop of 0.6 atmospheres. So the pressure inside is 0.4 atmospheres, 400 millibar. You'd have to go up, um, you know, about seven kilometers into the atmosphere to get that lower pressure. So what it does is if you have houses here that are in the vortices, you know, the atmosphere, you have atmospheric pressure inside the house and suddenly you drop the pressure outside the house to 
40% of the atmosphere, the whole house can break apart and the debris will go flying up into the funnel, making the funnel nice and dark, um, invisible. If you've got grass and sand here, that can go up in the funnel, making it visible. If you go over, over forests and things, you know, where the, you know, you'll get big trees and things that are harder to lift and, and the debris is much larger and the, the, the tornado can be hard to see, almost invisible. Um, you get also this movement airspeed in the funnel uh, up to 200 meters per second here. We talked about the 70 meters per second in an EF3 um, storm, which is the one that um, hit uh, Dunrobin and Gatineau. You have crosswinds, so you have warm air rising, you have cold air, you need that contrast. Um, the jet streams might be carrying this thing along, which can generate the rotation and so on. And this is another image, um, you know, this is a supercell here. You have upper level wind, you can have the anvil shape. You get the convection, it's overshooting the top. The air is going so fast that it's overshooting the top. This is the top of the lower atmosphere or the troposphere this is the troposphere down here a stratosphere above the dividing line will be the tropopause here um you get these uh vortices here and uh you get these downdrafts here so the the wind you know before the storm hits it can be very very windy that's the gust front coming through we've got the cold front coming through um, and that causes all the air to rise there's a sharp tilt on the storm, which is important because the, dra the when the, when the storm is tilted, the updraft and the downdraft will be in different locations. If the storm was vertical, the downdraft would come right over where the updraft is and perhaps quench the storm. Um, and uh, you can get these, uh, you know, there's, there's where the roughly where the tornado would would be. It would come out of the, uh, it would come out um, and come out of this region or towards the back often the storm is going this way in this case okay so there's lots of stuff there um, the other thing is is I this is some government of Canada data for September for Ottawa and I'm just showing that um, you know look at the temperatures here so we had this is the max min mean temperature so we had very you know 20 we had 28.3 degrees here was the maximum temperature um, on the 21st. So that would be in the afternoon. And then the, the cold front came through and it dropped the maximum temperature the next day to 15 degrees. So that big temperature difference, the cold front to the... So basically, um, you know, here's another climate change signature. We're getting all of these heat waves very hot temperatures. I mean, it's almost the end of September and we're hitting 28.3 Celsius. Very weird, weirdly warm, you know, for Ottawa, very high humidity. And then the cold front comes through that clash of the cold and warm air, um, you know, really fueled these storms. That warm air carried huge amounts of water vapor, which then rose, condensed and fed the energy into these storms, causing the multiple tornadoes to, to spin off. And then uh, since that day, it's been it's been a lot colder. Okay, so so basically, okay, so I've talked a lot about a lot of different things um, with tornadoes. So, you know, don't ask the question: Did climate change cause this tornado, or did it cause the storm? That's the wrong question. Climate change is disrupting the statistics of the atmosphere. We've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere and oceans. The change, we, we, we've uh, changed the way that heat moves in, in both atmosphere and oceans. We've disrupted uh, the jet streams because of the greatly warming Arctic. So all of the weather is happening in this new environment. And it is a new environment. And the, the, the danger is, you know, the, the climate change is accelerating so fast. The rate of change is enormous. Uh, it's affecting the globe. How will we be able to grow food, uh, you know, as these jet streams continue to shift? What about when there's no Arctic sea ice and the jet streams shift way, way more? Uh, anyway, thank you for listening to this series of videos.